like a real roach. And this cockroach-inspired design does give it a reasonable turn of speed. This robot can cover three body lengths a second. This prototype is programmed and driven by a large control unit attached by cables to the robot. But inspired by the success of the basic design and by the control systems of insects, Sprawlita evolved into iSprawl, a remote control version. And with a few further improvements in leg design, iSprawl can cover 15 body lengths a second in a surprisingly roach-like manner, though not yet close to the fastest roaches. But roaches aren't the only creatures providing inspiration for robot designers. If anything, ghost crabs are even more impressive performers. They can also run at speed, but on eight legs, not six. And they can switch from running forwards to sideways to backwards without ever breaking stride. Back in the lab, the ghost crab's running skills can be studied in more detail. They're also the perfect all-terrain vehicles. In this experiment, air bubbled through the sand turns it into the equivalent of quicksand. It slows the crab down. But a change in its gait, the crab's version of low gear ratio four-wheel drive, means it can easily cross this obstacle. And back on the treadmill, the scientists can also measure how much energy the crabs are using to move. And some very unexpected results are beginning to emerge. As they measured more and more species with different numbers of legs, they found similar relationships between the energy used and the forces that these creatures generate when walking. Between animals as different as humans, crabs, and dogs. One human leg is the same as two dog legs, or three roach legs, or four crab legs. An underlying principle of walking seems to be emerging, and this holds all the way up to a millipede with 180 legs. Understanding the basic principles behind nature's designs is the key to successful bio-inspired thinking. And millipedes, crabs, and roaches seem to be leading to totally new robot designs. Nature's walking machines rarely break down. And that's because nature goes in for a lot of redundancy. There's always a backup system. Creatures like millipedes and centipedes dramatically illustrate this principle. They have multiple repeated segments, each doing the same thing. A great many of these segments would have to be damaged to stop this 10 centimeter giant centipede from moving at speed over the forest floor. And its long, thin body allows it to squeeze through narrow gaps in pursuit of prey. At Penn State University in Philadelphia, this segmented robot works on just that principle. When it wants to move quickly, it can roll into a wheel, but then it unfurls to move like a mechanical caterpillar through narrow gaps. And it will take the loss of several of its segments to bring it to a halt. Giving a robot segments means it can behave even more like a centipede, making use of serpentine movements to move at high speed. The wheels on this robot are not powered. They merely allow the robot to glide over the floor, driven by its centipede-like undulations. But it's also possible to have the best of both worlds, of technology and nature, by combining wheels and legs. These robots do just that. 
hence their name, WEGS. This is, in essence, a cockroach on wheels. Wheeled legs give these robots the advantage of wheels, but with the roach's ability to negotiate obstacles. But roaches are still much better at covering rough ground, even at top speed. It only takes a slight change to their control system to allow them to do this, something that attracts as much envy as admiration from robot designers. And something else roaches do without breaking stride is climb up vertical surfaces. They do this by using tiny claws on their feet, which hook into any irregularities on the surface. How they attach and release these hooks is the secret to their success, a secret that has been unraveled by scientists at Stanford University. They've produced SpinyBot, a robot that can climb vertical surfaces using cockroach-like claws and an ingenious mechanism for hooking into the tiniest of cracks. But some insects can go where even roaches fear to tread. Flies have little trouble in climbing up smooth surfaces like glass, where a roach's claws would have nothing to hook into. A trick that's down to the fine details of the fly's foot. Magnified more than a thousand times, a fly's foot is covered in huge numbers of tiny hairs, each of which ends in a flattened plate. The fly oozes an oily liquid into the hairs, which sticks each of those thousands of plates onto the glass by a process called liquid adhesion. The same thing that causes a beer mat to stick to a wet glass. Robot designers have looked at flies but concluded that robots that leave oily footprints wouldn't be a good idea. Especially when there are bigger creatures that can climb smooth surfaces that might be easier to mimic, like tree frogs. The frog's feet are covered in mucus, but they don't seem to work in quite the same way that a fly's foot does. Because the frog is so much bigger, the mucus on its toes would have to be thicker to stick it to the glass, and then it couldn't unstick its feet. After all, climbing is as much about letting go as hanging on. When scientists looked closely at this mucus, they were surprised to find that it's not much thicker than water. Easy for the frog to lift its feet, but not sticky enough for it to hang on. The answer to this mystery lies in the fine detail of the frog's toes, a precise pattern of hexagonal plates. Each plate can move separately to line up with any irregularities on the surface, and the canals carry away any excess mucus that might separate the plates from the surface. At smaller scales again, each plate is covered with tiny bumps, the tips of which make close contact with the surface so close that it's friction that stops a frog sliding down the glass. Which is making car tire manufacturers sit up and take notice. Perhaps new and safer tires based on the toes of a frog? But for sheer sticking power, nothing beats this creature, a gecko. Geckos can race up a vertical wall with no problems and they can even hang upside down from the ceiling. It's been calculated that a gecko's feet are so sticky that it could support a weight of 25 kilograms before it falls off. All this on dry toes with no kind of adhesive whatsoever. 
Again, the secret lies in the microscopic detail of the gecko's toes. Like the fly's foot, the gecko's toes are covered in a dense mat of hairs. Moving closer still, each hair branches at the tip into dozens of microscopic hairs, each of which is so tiny that it can get incredibly close to the surface of the wall, so close that it can feel the forces that attract molecules together, the van der Waals forces. The molecules of the gecko's hairs and those of the wall are drawn to each other, and the force, magnified millions of times by the huge number of hairs, produces the incredible stickiness of the gecko's toes. But with such sticking power, unsticking is a real problem. The gecko has to curl its toes to unpeel them from the surface before it can lift its foot. Scientists have developed a sticky tape covered in microscopic pillars that works on the same principle as a gecko's foot. But before they can use it to build their own mechanical geckos, they have to work out a way of unpeeling it so the robot isn't just stuck in one place. At Case Western Reserve University in Ohio, this little robot has been designed to study just that. The way gecko tape sticks to glass and then unpeels. Once perfected, it should allow much bigger robots to climb as securely as a gecko. Whether climbing, walking, or flying, robots need a way to move their limbs. Often, designers use some sort of motor, where nature uses muscles. But these robots have been designed with devices that mimic the action of muscles. Flexible tubes in the same position as muscles are driven by air pressure, which forces the limbs to bend or straighten. A very similar action to living muscles, and the result is most lifelike. In most animals looked at so far, the energy needed to walk varies in a predictable way with the size of the animal. But nature has come up with one or two surprises. When caribou walk, they use far less energy than predicted by our equations. And when they move from hard ground to soft snow, the energy they use hardly increases. It's not entirely clear how they perform this trick, though their hooves certainly play a part. They're only loosely attached by ligaments and so can splay out like snowshoes when pressed onto the ground. But the real secret of their success must lie in making each swing of their legs as economic as possible. The caribou's extreme energy efficiency has been shaped by their need to make long treks over snowy landscapes. Each year, they move from more sheltered areas in the south, where they spent the winter, to more exposed coastal slopes, where the females will give birth. Here, the grazing is better, and they should find some respite from uncountable swarms of biting insects. But no one's yet braving these remote, mosquito-infested regions to work on a robo-caribou. Especially when there's more than enough inspiration much closer to home. Our own bodies have also been shaped by natural selection to produce our unique, 
two-legged gait. 